If you've listened to this podcast for any period of time, if you've listened to any of the recent episodes, then you already know that Brandon and I started an air conditioning company January 1 of this year, 2018. As of right now, it's about the first week of February in 2018. We have a lot of the basics set up, the foundation set up, our QuickBooks are set up. We're using Service Titan as our software program to dispatch technicians and keep track of customers. The one thing that we don't have in place is a flat rate software. Well, that was until today. We signed the papers to get started with the new flat rate software. This is Terse Blissett, and you're listening to the Service Business Mastery Podcast. Today's episode, we're going to talk with Rodney Cope. Rodney's the founder of the new flat rate program. On this episode, we're going to discuss what happens whenever a service tech is asked to become a salesman and how you can solve the resistance that typically comes with a service tech being asked to sell. After going to the class at the new flat rate, my eyes were open to so many possibilities when it comes to actually offering options to a customer. In the past, I know that we've gone to the customer and said, hey, your system's 10 years old or your system's 12 years old and you have a leaking EVAP cool. So we don't even recommend you fixing it. We just recommend you replacing the system or giving some sort of hard ultimatum. And the new flat rate really does away with us having to provide ultimatums to a customer. I mean, not everybody does. A lot of people will give several options. I've always given several options in the past, but it's really nice whenever you can just say, hey, look, here's all your options. Do you want to do this? Does this seem like it's getting to where you might want to think about replacing the system? The way that it's said and the way that it's presented at the new flat rate, it makes a whole lot more sense it's really clear that you have the customer's best interest in mind and you go from a 50, 60, call it 70% closing rate to a 99 to a hundred percent closing rate, because no matter what, whether you're selling a system or you're doing a parts replacement, you're still leaving the house with the revenue, which is great. I mean, I love that aspect of it. Another thing that Roddy and I discuss a little bit about is the fact that whenever he owned his own air conditioning company, he had his own service company and he was trying to do flat rate. There were other flat rate softwares out there already. So why didn't he just use that? Why didn't he just use the software companies that were already out there? And Rodney will explain to you the reason why he created his own program rather than just using whatever was on the shelf. So Brandon and I are going to start using the new flat rate program. Brandon and I will be implementing the new flat rate software in the next week or so. They should take about three or four days before our program is up and going after we've approved the uh, pricing and everything. So as soon as that happens, I'll give you more details and I'll let you follow along and I won't be shy. I'll let you know exactly what I think. As of right now, I'm sold on it. Brandon has issues with the commercial side of things. So we have to figure that out. I really want to go do a ride along with somebody that is a commercial company that uses the new flat rate. So if you know anybody that does do that and they wouldn't mind for me to ride along with them, I can drive wherever and come meet them. That way we can kind of experience what it's like for a commercial side. I understand completely how it will work with residential, but I'm not a hundred percent sure how it's going to work with commercial. But with all that being said, I'd like to introduce to you Rodney Cope. How's life been? Life is pretty darn good. I've seen you uh, been spending a lot of time with grandkids, babysitting. Yeah, I realize why people, when they retire, they buy motorhomes and they travel. It's just a good <laughs> way. Otherwise, your kids keep dumping their kids on you. That's so bad. My parents live right on the road. And I'm doing a lot of networking stuff with the business. I'm constantly saying, hey, can y'all watch them so I can go to this networking event? They always say yes, but I feel bad about it. Just so you know. It's not like you can do anything else when you have the grandkids there. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> My sister just moved in right down the street literally last week. So she's going to start getting that phone call now. 
she loves spending time with them, but it's going to get old. I know that. And my kids are really good mannered too. So uh, Also, if it's just for a few hours, that's not an intrusion into the day. The problem with the networking stuff is this always starts at like six or seven o'clock at night and it lasts until nine or 10 or 11. It's sometimes it's easier for them just to come to our house because the kids go to sleep at eight o'clock, just stick them in the bed and then watch TV at our house if they don't have something to do at their house. Cool. You have a history of being a business owner and then you have, am I correct, nine children? That's correct. Okay. And how many grandchildren? 10. Okay, cool. Tell me a little bit about the new flat rate, how it got started, and then if it leads into the owning the business or prerequisite the business or whatnot. For one, why it's called the new flat rate, but it's not like a true flat rate company. You and I talked about the term flat rate and how even that process, that term is a thing of the past compared to like, that's not the thing of the future. But the new flat rate program is a menu style program. And why call it the new flat rate versus calling it menu pricing or whatnot? It kind of goes back to the beginning. As a contractor who grew up in a contracting family, like many of your listeners, I'm sure, I came up with the school of hard knocks. And also that school is wide experience because you experience just about every aspect. So, of course, having started a business of my own, I followed a lot of the same things as a lot of other contractors. I was fortunate to have early success because I got some large industrial projects and very successful financially originally. But what does that mean? It means to a guy who was making $37,000 a year when I quit my job and started my company in 1990. And then six weeks later, I had $10,000 cash in my pocket. I had never had $10,000 <laughs> cash in my life. Here's the problem. The first three years, it was easy like that. Money was like water. Unfortunately, when that happens, you actually think you know what you're doing. <laughs> <laughs> I've always said that early success is probably more of a curse than a blessing because you have to go through failure to get to any kind of a foundational success in your life. I think most of us know that. My problem came when I attempted to grow the business. For some reason, we all think that bigger is better and that if we got bigger, we would be more stable and our employees would have more stability. Otherwise, the danger is we don't have work next week, so now we lose our employees. So I did like a lot of people in their early to mid-90s. I took some commercial work. I grew up doing service work. So I went into those areas. But in the mid-90s, which is when I first heard about flat rate pricing, and it was really, really great, because at that time, the customers didn't know what the parts were. They couldn't buy the parts. They didn't really care because our prices were very, very reasonable. So when we said it's a widget and it's uh, $58, they'd just be fine. We'd put it in for $58, add a $49 service charge or dispatch fee, and there's a $100 ticket. And of course, I'm in Georgia. And in 95, I bought a heating and air company. I got into air conditioning from electrical. And when I got into air conditioning, my view was that the streets were lined up with homeowners, as far as the eye could see, standing on the curb, waving $100 bills. <laughs> <laughs> I think that we've all had that vision. But in the day when the $100 service call was more than enough, those were good days and they lasted about six months. <laughs> yeah. I was going to say, what was your average ticket price back then? Oh yeah. Before flat rate, it was $58. When I went to flat rate, it was $119. And that was good at the time or? I mean, that was good because I was charging $25 an hour for time and material electrical work, $35 for HVAC work. And so on average call was typically not more than an hour. So and parts are cheap. That was good for me. I didn't know any better. But then that's also the same time I heard about in trying to grow, I get this, I devoured the trade magazines, always have. So when I bought a heating and air company, I started to get the heating and air magazines. I'm telling you, they're different than electrical. HVAC, there's so much about marketing. I never knew about service and dispatch software or anything like that. I saw an article about a company in Florida called Service Experts. And this was before Service Experts became a consolidator. They actually did the model after this guy. I read an article. He had 50 trucks. I'm like, oh my gosh, I got to talk to this guy. After I read the article, 
I picked up the phone and I started calling, and this was before internet really, so I was able to get a hold of the guy. And he talked to me for a good little while, and he told me that I had to join CGS or something like that. But my territory was spoken for. So too bad I couldn't do that. And I was just bummed because I thought, oh my gosh, if I could join that, I would know everything and I could be successful. I was just starting to really see struggle in my contracting life, trying to grow, then getting into heating and air and getting those big bills from my carrier supplier. At this point, how long had you been in business? About six years. I'd went through my successful period. Then I had went into my commercial period. I was losing money like crazy. Well, maybe even breaking even, but having to wait so long for my money. They were big ticket items, so they appeared to be beneficial. And I felt successful. I had accounts receivable that might go 150, 200,000, and that was big business to me. Well, it was at all my biggest commercial project was I think about $240,000. When the numbers are big, you think, wow, we're a big company, right? I found out about a group called Contractors 2000, which is now Nexstar. And I hurried to sign up with them. Was really excited because now I was around people who were willing to share anything and everything. And they would show me their invoices, their flat rate books, anything that they had. And I'd go to the meetings. I wanted to be just like them. But the ones that were actually successful were pretty good sized businesses. They'd been around a long time. And they were run by businessmen more than entrepreneurs like me. There's a big difference between business people and entrepreneurs. Entrepreneurs work off cash. We've got to have a cash flow because when it's gone, we default to no plan. (laughs) Business people, they have a plan and they stick to it. Entrepreneurs seldom become business people. They can, but they seldom do. Anyway, I joined Nexstar and at that time I found out about flat rate pricing. I bought a flat rate program. But the reason my tickets doubled, went from $58 to 119 was because the flat rate company taught me about a service and dispatch charge. They convinced me to have one. My first one was $49. So in reality, when I went to flat rate, it was like getting a $50 bill automatically stapled to every ticket because I had never had a service and dispatch charge before. No customers complained or even mentioned it. It wasn't so much flat rate that made it all so successful. It's that flat rate included a service and dispatch charge. So anyway, I went through uh, Nexstar for five years. My business wasn't growing. So I joined Airtime 500 and spent three years with them. They had exciting ideas, a one-page pricing sheet. It looked good, but all it was was all of your parts and tasks put onto one page. It's no different. I began to realize then that all flat rate was the same. It was just a list of parts that looked different. Later on, when the iPads came out, it looked different again, but it was just a list of parts. So I did all those, went to sales training, a lot of what a lot of people do. When I added it all up, I spent about $360,000 over a 10-year period on all of the consultants, the training, the best practices groups. I don't regret it because I learned a lot, but nobody really had answers. Less than 5% of all the contractors were actually successful, in my opinion, and anybody could do their own numbers. So like many of today's contractors, I was born into a contracting family and started my career with these words, get out of bed, you're helping your brothers. So the rest is kind of history. With its ups and downs, I tried to get out of the hard work, hard knocks industry by spending a year selling cars. That was way back in 1980. Then I tried several multi-level marketing businesses. I sent in my $35 to ads at the back of magazines and newspapers for the easy way to riches. (laughs) (laughs) I actually know now that like contracting, many of those easy ways were actually good bona fide methods, but they, like everything else, takes hard work and experience. It's really 20 years to an overnight success, I think. Most people would probably agree with that pretty quick. Moving south from the harshness of the northern Minnesota borders to Georgia put me smack back into contracting. It seemed the only job I could get was as an electrician, but it was a pretty big company. So after three months of trying to get hired outside the electrical field, I came back into it with a new appreciation for the skills that my dad had forced me to learn because they now fed my family. Not only that, my new attitude was highly appreciated by my new employer. 
I was promoted quickly over a couple of years to land on the board of directors as the manager of all of our North Georgia business. As education director for the company, I was responsible for technical training for our 100 electrician force. Having earned over 10 electrical licenses over a five-state area gave me exposure to deep technical and code training that I then passed on to my peers. So like many entrepreneurs, I left that company when I couldn't agree with the direction they were going. Or let's say they didn't agree with me. (laughs) The rest of that is history. I'm sure a lot of people can relate to that. We all left for some reason or another. But as a businessman, I was forced to learn the hard lessons, and early success didn't help. It seemed so easy at first that I wondered, gee, why hadn't I always done this? But then came the costs of thinking that I needed to grow and be a big shot. Eight years later, I was over a quarter of a million dollars in debt. I'm sure some can relate to that. Oh, yeah. More often than not, I feel like. Now, the struggles, frustrations, and disappointments that I faced. They brought me to a place of believing that we had been cheated to believe that what had become a standard method of doing service was the only method. See, I was trying to copy all the other contractors, all of the companies that looked successful, whether it was in service or commercial work, but it just led to struggle. We had been thoroughly and deeply taught. This was my mantra. I totally believed that I could hire clean, sharp, articulate, intelligent service people with selling and communication skills, and that they would sell and upsell my services in homes and businesses. Over time, and this was about a 10-year grueling time of putting every resource I had into this, I spent every dime on trying to make this work. I lost a lot of employees. I hired a lot of employees. I took employees. Do you think that you lost any employees that were really, really good employees, but you were trying to make a process? What do you think was the cause of losing them? Do you think that you were pushing them too hard because you were trying to figure out like the golden nugget? See, there was two kind of employees at that time. Number one was good technicians, skilled workers, but they didn't want to sell. They didn't even really want to talk a lot to the customer. They wanted to be appreciated for their skills and talents. We kind of drove them out because we would make them sit basically through sales training and try to convince them how wonderful it would be if they could upsell in the home. (laughs) (laughs) I've heard that so many times. And you go to some of the classes and the guys are like, if you're going to ask me to sell something, I'm going to quit. You'll go to classes at supply houses and those guys are like, the first time somebody asked me to start selling something, I'm looking for a job because they've been burnt so many times by guys that are like, okay, We're going to pin everybody against each other. Whoever has the most upsells wins this TV. And then you get guys that just want to fix it and they don't want to upsell anything. And they're like, so great. I'm just going to be working here at this company and I'm never going to get the TV. Exactly. Isn't that the truth? Yeah. So then what were we encouraged to do? Hire people that could sell. I mean, it's one thing to say, well, hire for attitude. You can train mechanical aptitude. No, you can hire for attitude, but they better have skills as well in the trade. So I and others, we started recruiting salespeople. I hired people right off of car sales lots. I thought, man, if this guy's a good car salesman, I'll put him in a truck with somebody and then he can learn to trade. So we kind of pushed the pendulum all the way to hiring salespeople that knew nothing about our trade. That was a flash in the pan, some quick success, and then it all fell apart. So then we went looking for people who had selling and communication skills and were good technicians. Remember, I told you there's two kinds of employees that we lost. We lost the skilled craftsmen who just wanted to do a great job. And then we hired these guys that were good service people, but also had selling and communication skills. And then we spent all of our money on their training to make them even better. Now, the problem with that is there's no such thing as a service technician with selling and communication skills. The guy that can do both is an entrepreneur. Is a left brain and a right brain entrepreneur. That's right. (laughs) Yeah. That's where we find most of ourselves that own businesses. That's right. See, we all came through that, didn't we? Yeah. Here's the problem we took our money, in my case, hundreds of thousands of dollars, every dime that I made that should have been profit for my family, and I invested it into these entrepreneurs. I'm in Georgia. I sent guys to classes as far away as Los Angeles. 
Orlando, Chicago, St. Louis, because of the dream that everything is going to work. If I just do this, it'll all work. But you know what happened to all those guys, don't you? They started their own business. They changed their name to competitor. (laughs) (laughs) And some of them even took company names that we had dreamed up while they were working for me. I guess it is a dream board. Yeah, brainstorming, you know. And they just took notes right off your dream board. and (laughs) And I'm not mad at any of them. I don't begrudge them. I respect them. Are those guys still in business? Yeah, at least three of them are. They're good quality people. None of them followed my let's all get big dream. Oh, okay. Just a one or two man shop. But like one guy that was my right hand man who was actually very intelligent. His wife's a school teacher. He's a very good service technician and sells and replaces. And between him and his wife, they live a very smart and sensible lifestyle. I think he saw the frustrations that I had. He saw the frustrations that others have had. He was smart enough to just create a business that worked for him. What happened after that is I did Nexstar, Airtime 500, BDR, of course, all of the sales coaches and things like that. I learned a lot from all of these places. But what happened is I came to the end result that everything I was doing to try to be successful was like walking up to a Ferris wheel. And I call it the fantasy Ferris wheel in my book. And you pay your ticket to ride. For example, you join a best practice group. And a lot of them are great. But you might pay $20,000 to join. That's a lot of money to a struggling contractor. And then the whole time you're riding, you're paying. Sometimes every week. So you go up. Oh, my, this is going to be great. It might be six months. It might be five years. But at the end of the ride, you find yourself right back where you started with a whole lot less money and a whole lot more frustration. And then something else comes along and you take a ride on that. Maybe now it's airtime 500. It's this or it's that. But either way, you keep riding. And one day I realized what the problem was. Problem isn't so much the ride. The problem is that everybody believed that if you somehow did the right thing, your service technicians would sell and upsell for you. Either you took a whip and beat them into it or you put a carrot on a stick. You gave them every kind of money, incentives, perks, bonuses commissions, high pay, whatever it might be. Now the big thing is performance payment plans. Everything that you're saying, I hear it constantly in the chat groups. Everybody's trying to figure out this exact same thing. And here's what it is. Everything that you see out there, they're trying to fix one problem. The problem is service technicians don't sell and upsell in the home. I don't care what it is. They're all trying to manipulate that guy and get him to sell. So he will solve their problem. You think of that. You're a business owner. You have a problem. You don't have enough revenue. And you keep putting that problem on the technician and sending them out the door and basically say, go get my money. Eventually, they get tired of that, don't they? They see you as a greedy business owner. What happens if they do get it? Let's say a guy can sell 10 or 20,000 a week. Then he gets tired of what? Bringing it back to you. He sees that ten or twenty thousand dollars going to you and thinks that it should be going in his pocket, or he thinks he could do it the same thing or do something better than what you're doing. The one thing that changed my life was the day I stood up and I realized this was a lie. I was lying to myself, believing that somehow I could get service technicians to sell. All of my research, all of my reading was beginning to prove to me that it was impossible. For example, New York Life will take 1,000 applications as an insurance salesman. Out of that, over the course of the next two years, they only will hope to get three people who can make a living and build a career selling insurance. I've heard that before. They expect you to fail as a salesman there. And those people came looking for a sales job. So if you've got service technicians that did not hire on for a sales job, How in the world do you think you're going to get them to start making a living by selling? And if you wanted to make a living by selling, Tersh, do you really want to do it crawling through attics? Why not sell BMWs? It's the same process, right? And the commission is probably very similar, if not more. And you stay clean. And you can dress nice. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) All right. Once I realized that, I had to find a solution. I had been studying Ford Motor Company since 1971. Because in 1971, I saw that the Ford dealer charged $32 an hour to work on my dad's trucks. We only charged $16 an hour to do their electrical work. My entire life, I have studied Ford Motor Company. 
I bought stock in Ford Motor Company at a young age. I noticed that even though we thought flat rate came from the auto industry, they don't use it the way we do. They don't have service technicians or auto mechanics come to you and try to sell and upsell you. You don't even talk to the mechanics, do you? What is that person called? Service writer. Yeah, service writer. I mean, that's obvious. So from there, I went looking at Fortune 500 companies like IBM. IBM is very much like an HVAC company. They service, they repair, they sell, and they install. But they totally separate the mechanics from the salespeople. Why? They need excellent programmers, excellent installers, excellent troubleshooters, and excellent salespeople. They don't expect one person to wear all those hats at all. So then I brought it home and I went down to McDonald's. I bought a Coca-Cola and I sat down at a little table where I could watch the cash register. And I began to time people to see how long it take them to make a decision when they looked at the menu. How many people complained that the price of hamburgers was too much? How many people came in saying, you sold my wife an $8 hamburger yesterday and that's highway robbery. And I realized that with no sales training, no sales effort at all, these guys were doing eight, ten, twenty thousand dollars a shift, and yet there was no selling, but there was no price objection either, and no buyer's remorse. So from there, I went to Lowe's and Home Depot, and I spent hundreds of hours watching people. I couldn't believe how fast people would buy, say, a two hundred dollar faucet for their kitchen, uh, eight hundred dollar tub. Not to mention small parts. They would look up, down, left, right. If you go to a big box store, just watch people. When they walk up to a wall, they look up, down, left, right, reach, grab, put it in the basket, 15 seconds. It's amazing. (laughs) That's so funny. I'm going to start watching people when I go to Lowe's. I'm a people watcher anyways, and I do notice something similar to that, but I haven't really been watching for that habit. Well, my daughter and I went to Home Depot one day specifically to interview the lady selling the appliances because there's no salespeople in the big box stores except cabinets and appliances. Those people, they might use some sales techniques, but you know, really not much. But the point is we went there to interview. But when we got out of the car, I told my daughter to just wait a minute. Let's watch. Because I had noticed some people walking toward the door where my competitor was giving out free hot dogs. They were probably about 30 feet away. When they saw that there was free hot dogs being given away, they turned and went to another door, walked farther. Oh, just walked around everything to get away from. And I thought, my gosh, I love to get free hot dogs from my competitors. <laughs> right. That's why we go to supply houses. That's why we go there. So we started <laughs> counting and we noticed that about three out of 10 people would get out of their cars, start walking toward that main entrance and see the hot dogs and walk farther to one of the other entrances. Because of it, I developed what I call indisputable rule number one of selling. Everybody hates it if you try to sell them something. And I realized we go into a home to fix something and then something changes. I mean, they called us there to get it fixed. They took off work to get it fixed. They greeted us at the door planning to get it fixed. There's no way they weren't going to get this fixed. And then we show them the price in our flat rate book and they don't get it fixed. How is that possible? Because that means they're going to have to call somebody else, take off work again, and go through the whole process again. If you stop and think about that, we must have offended them greatly to have stopped their buying process. And I realized it's because of rule number one. They not only hate it if you try to sell them something, they hate it if they just think you're trying to sell them something. But hate isn't really a good enough word. They detest it. It's a violation of their human rights because they will actually send you out the door. When I realized that was happening, I said, we've got to change what we're doing. Number one, these guys will not sell and upsell in the home. And number two, the customer doesn't want them to sell and upsell in the home. But number three, I noticed that everywhere those customers went, whether it's Home Depot, Lowe's, Sears, Menards, whether it's McDonald's or Ford, the customer upsold themselves. Less than 20% of the people would ever take the cheapest item, no matter where they are. Amazing. I realized we just need to get some of that. How do they do that? 
Well, at that time, we were experimenting with writing options and trying to assume what people would buy, giving people choices. But I realized it had to be even more standard. So we came up with five options for every task or repair. And it didn't start with thousands and thousands of menus. It started with one. Let's go try this. So we began testing ideas. How long was it after you were in business did you start the menu pricing? I was in business six years before I joined best practices groups. That ran about seven or eight years that I tried those things. For the next three years, we were trying all of our own ideas mixed with what we learned from sales trainers and everybody else. When we had high closing success, we had very little customer retention. If we could convince a customer to buy an $1,800 repair for something that would be reasonable, they would buy it, but they would never use us again. Well, the whole process was only a few years, but I was in business about 18 years. Interestingly enough, in 2008, when it crashed, with all of the education I had paid for, all of the industry's greatest whatever, consulting and talents, when 2008 hit, I said, screw it, it's price. (laughs) And we repriced everything dirt cheap, just trying to stay in business. But it was after that that we started thinking there had to be a better way. And in 2010, my son Matt and I were experimenting with completely done menus. If it's a capacitor, use this menu. If it's a coil, use this menu. We were having great, great success with it. We were by then experimenting with habitual buying, understanding how customers buy. And when they buy with the same methods that they buy at Home Depot or anyplace else, There's no buyer's remorse. Our sales could double and triple and nobody ever had buyer's remorse. And they would always refer us to their friends. And we thought, my gosh. But in order to fine tune it, I hired a consultant out of California by the name of Jay Abraham, considered to be a marketing genius. I went to Los Angeles and met with him 12 times for two days each. And he taught me how to run beta tests. So we began to test our ideas in January of 2011, every place in eight states. The first day anybody tested it, their average ticket went up $200. It was just like magic. We tested a heating process, a heating book, we called it, for two months. Then we stopped and we wrote a 65 menu cooling book at the time. Then in June of 2011, we started running beta tests on that, had the exact same result. And by the end of the summer, people were asking to buy the product that we had never planned to create. We just were making it for ourselves. But through Jay Abraham's guidance, we learned a ton from our first beta testers. So you had no intentions of originally selling this product. It was just something that you were creating for yourself, but you had other people testing it so that you could work out the kinks. Is that correct? Everything I had ever done, all the money I'd spent, everything, the passion was to try to find a way to be successful in this business instead of quitting and getting out, which I'd certainly consider that many times. But once we realized we had a process that worked, then we saw that every service contractor needed this. And so then we saw the opportunity to sell it, but also the opportunity to help a struggling industry, an industry of underpaid service contractors. So you found success? Yeah, obviously. The first two years were 10-hour days. Well, my heating and air company was doing pretty well then because even though by that time we only had one technician, my son Matt, we were subbing out all of our install, but our tickets were wonderful and we had really, really high indoor air quality tickets. Very, very profitable that way. But the money coming off of that business was being funneled into the new flat rate to support building this whole program. So the first two years were um, pretty much of a struggle, and then it really just started to kind of take off. Do you still have the other business, the AC company? No. After about three years in, I think, my oldest son came and bought it from me. He's the company that we were subbing all our work to for the last 10 years. He had his own service company, and so he actually bought that company from me. Three years into the new flat rate is when you sold the AC company to your other son? Yeah, I think it was three or four years in. And by that time, the new flat rate was self-supporting. Did Matt work at the AC company? He helped us with every waking moment. And then he had to run the service calls. He actually was pretty much running the whole company, just him out doing whatever he could do. And I would still take indoor air quality calls because they were extremely profitable. But 
Yeah, we were struggling to run two businesses, but by that time we had answers. Well, see, we finally had a solution to the money. We finally could be profitable every time we walked in the door. When you go to average tickets of two and $300 to average tickets of 800 to $1,500 and still have happy customers, all of a sudden everything works. The reason we had to sell that business, though, was because Matt and I were having to travel because some people that were buying the new flat rate wouldn't buy it unless we would come out and train their people. When Matt started traveling, we had nobody to do our service. We were just kind of letting it dwindle because we didn't know what else to do. And then my son bought it and took it over. Yeah, that leads me into a great point that I would like to make about the new flat rate. We're both on Facebook. We spend lots of time in the different groups and whatnot. One of the owner's groups, it was literally day before yesterday, an owner got on there and mentioned the new flat rate and they were using the new flat rate program because someone else was asking about a flat rate program period. And this guy came on and he recommended a new flat rate and I did as well. And we started talking back and forth about the new flat rate and then others chimed in and we're asking about, is that the program that doesn't use part names? And the guy that uses it a lot right now, he said, yes. And I struggled with it until I went to the class. So as soon as I went to the class and Matt taught me exactly what the reason and the com- taking the parts as a commodity, everything clicked. And I realized that I was no longer selling parts. I was selling service. That's what I learned when I went to your class, because I was at your class about a month ago It was crazy because when I went in there, I didn't really even know what to expect at all. I was just flattered that y'all invited me up there and to check out your program because I was interested in it. But the concerns that I had with the program, as soon as I talked to Matt and Leo about it, it was on point. It made so much more sense. And it was just this huge aha moment that we're all selling the same parts. Some of us will buy a foreign manufactured part that's a lot less expensive and then others or trying to stand behind American made with five-year warranties and all this other stuff. But either way we get into the conversation of the part itself. So we're trying to sell the commodity, the part, and then you really don't have the argument of service. Everybody says that we do the best service in town. We do this and we do that, but it's a broken record. We all say the same exact thing. We all have the same things written on our websites, but at the end of the day, we're just selling a part. And the part is very easily Googled. You can check it out on Amazon and even some equipment you can purchase on Amazon and on Google. So the new flat rate program, can you go into a little bit of detail with some of the hangups that you've had with people and some of their concerns and what the solutions may be? And the biggest thing that I have is anything that anybody has ever come to me with whenever I've talked to them about the new flat rate, because I've recommended it to several people since going to your class. The concern that they've had was the parts names and that kind of things. And I've always said, look, man, you really need to take the class because it really helps out a lot. Could you address that just a little bit? What's happened to us is that in the mid 90s, which is when most of us first ever used the email, we started uh, getting our own email addresses from the mid to the late 90s. We actually might have got into a chat board then. But at that time, flat rate was working well because our prices were reasonable and people didn't have access to parts. Suppliers wouldn't sell to them. And we didn't have the online wholesalers and we didn't have a Home Depot on every corner like we do now. So what happened is by the early 2000s, we were starting to run into these struggles, mostly with like eBay at the time, or they could go online to Johnstone or to whatever and find prices. What's happened is the entire industry of online retailers and the big box retailers have put all of the emphasis on price, cheap. Well, they have commoditized the industry worse than it ever had been before. So parts are cheap. You know it. I know it. Your customer knows it. Imagine if you walked into McDonald's and said, I'm interested in that Big Mac. And the guy grabs a Big Mac and says, let me show you this beef. Look at that. That is 100% American beef. What's the customer going to say? Well, big deal. So is Burger King. So is White Castle. As soon as you put the emphasis on a part, now the customer has to compare. They have to defend their own position because now you're trying to sell me on your idea. So now that puts up sales resistance. 
some people think we change the name of the parts. Do we call a capacitor voltage surge suppressor? No, we did not change the name of the parts. We got rid of parts. Now the focus is on our service, talent, skill, knowledge, wisdom. What the customer sees is an emphasis on the system. We've been trying to get our technicians to think in terms of systems forever. We would tell them, look at the whole electrical system. Look at the whole refrigerant system. Well, guess what? Now we say, Mr. Customer, I'm a little concerned. I found a fault in the voltage absorption system. Well, guess what? The voltage absorption system includes a capacitor, but it also includes everything in that electrical circuit that feels and or absorbs and releases any kind of electrical current, particularly surges, spikes, and things like that, damaging things to the circuit. So when there's a spike, coming down the line, what feels it? The high voltage wire, the low voltage wire, the wire nuts, the terminations, the screws, the grounding, the bonding, the coils, the relays, everything. That's why the capacitor is there. The capacitor is to hopefully be a spring that can kind of absorb and release voltage and help the whole system. But sometimes it self-sacrifices. So we say to the customer, I'm a little concerned there's a fault in the voltage absorption system. Now, what does that do? It lets the customer make a choice. If they take the most basic repair, which we call a Band-Aid, because a Band-Aid is a high quality repair for a small problem, if they choose that, we're going to replace that main component. But we're still going to check some other stuff. But, but think about this. What could we do if they said, you know what, I would like you to use all of your skills, your craftsmanship, your knowledge, your wisdom, and your experience so that I don't have to take off work and have this problem again? Well, my top option is a complete voltage system restoration. Well, what is that? I'm going to go through, I'm going to tighten every terminal, I'm going to put every stake on, I'm going to replace any that are weak, I'm going to check the circuit boards, coils, relays, replace the capacitor, of course, I might add a hard start kit. But when I'm done, I'll put every screw back in the unit, it'll be clean, it'll be nice, and guess what? You can go back to work, Mr. Customer, and you don't have to worry about anything. Well, guess what? Why wouldn't they want that? So our top option is a complete renovation of that system, and we put the language into the menu that says all that in a way that the customer, the consumer, sits there and nods their head. Yeah, that makes a whole lot of sense, see? So all we do is we don't sell anything. We just show them a menu. Our top option is this, but take your pick. They can choose whatever they want. Typically, 20 to 30% at the most will take the bottom options. You know why? Because they don't want to have to take off work again to go through this process. Yeah, their time is more valuable than the additional price that we perceive as maybe not as worth it. Like Matt was saying in the class, he asked the AC guys, if your water heater quit working on it, the first thing you're going to do is pick up the phone and call somebody to fix it. And nobody in the whole classroom raised their hand, even the AC guys only that didn't do any kind of plumbing. You're going to go in, you're going to mess with it, and you're going to figure it out. And you're more than likely going to fix it yourself. But you're not your customer. Your customer is not the one that's going to go and mess with the AC unit and try and test that capacitor and see if it works or not. And then go to one of the supply houses that'll sell them apart or get online and order the capacitor. Your ideal customer is going to be one who values their time. They're going to be the ones that don't want to miss work again. So they're going to call you and they want it fixed right then. If you're going to say, okay, I'm only going to offer the Band-Aid option, then you're deciding for the customer what they can and can't afford and what they value and what they do not value because they may value their time over the price. It could be 300% more to go the next option up and they may choose it because it's the value of them not having to miss work is worth it. We don't know what these people are making per hour or how many times they can miss work. They may be on the last leg of the ability to miss work and they know that if they take off work again, they're going to get fired. So they're more than willing to pay whatever else. You don't want to take advantage of the fact that they're going to get fired, but we don't have the right to decide what is in their best interest or what is their choice as far as prices go. And if they choose the top tier option, they're going to get top tier quality of work. Not to say that you're going to do less of a quality of work at the bottom tier, but you're going to do a whole lot. Whenever you look at the amount of time that's allotted for the top tier, no matter what the option is, you have the ability to be there the better part of a day cleaning the unit and checking it out and everything. And it's crazy whenever somebody puts up resistance to the new flat rate program, 
it's weird because going through the class, I'm like, okay, well, I can answer all those objections that you have. And I don't even use the program on a daily basis. If you just gave the program a chance, I feel like you would really have a great experience. And the ones that I feel like are failing with the program are the ones who don't have proper training. I feel like if you sent one guy to the class and then that one guy went back and trained everybody, I don't know that there would be a whole lot of success there personally, because there's some things that I can't even explain. And I was at the class and I was attentive and taking notes and everything. And I'm not in the program all the time. So I couldn't train everybody like you and Matt and Leo and all those guys that were there at the class. I truly recommend going to the class, even if you got to fly from Seattle to Atlanta or have Matt come out there to you and train y'all on it. Well, you know, it's funny because, of course, we train all of the United States, but we also train here in Dalton, Georgia every month. It just really gives me great joy when I look at the list. We might have anywhere from 18 to 30 people here. There's no way to guess. I'll have people from Oregon, Washington, New York, Florida, Texas, California, some people from Georgia, Tennessee. They just come from wherever they are. The program is different because I realized that what we were doing didn't work. Believing what we believed didn't work. What we were being told, which was filtered down to us from the manufacturers, the distributors, which are all wholesalers, to our sales trainers, consultants, and business practices groups, all of the training in the industry boils down to one thing. You can make that service technician sell. That is a lie. You cannot. It won't work. That's why there's more than 10 times as many service companies now, probably 20 or more times the service companies than there was 15 years ago, because we've pushed them all out into their own businesses. That's why over 90%, probably over 95% of all service companies are three people or less. But because it's changed, it is different. It had to be different or it could not work. But it had to be based on three things. Honesty. Service people, contractors, they want to be honest, and they can't last long if they're not. And by the way, honesty, it's not hiding anything. Anything the customer wants to know, I'll tell them. I'll show them parts. I'll discuss anything they want. The thing is, they don't ask a lot of questions. Number two, integrity. Integrity is you do the right thing, even if the customer doesn't know what a complete combustion ignition renovation is. If he doesn't even know what a complete voltage distribution system renovation, you do the right thing. See, you're the professional. You're the expert. So honesty, integrity, and then common sense. When I started out as an electrician in 1971, as I began to understand, I could go on a job and use my common sense to solve problems and to do the right thing. When the industry got deep into flat rate, The service technicians were no longer able to use common sense. Mr. Customer, it's a capacitor. Here's in the book. It's $200. Customer says, put it in. What's the service technician supposed to do? He's supposed to put it in, test it, and get the heck out of there. When I was a service technician back in the time of the material days, back in the service days, we would replace the part. Say maybe it was a circuit breaker or something. But while I was in the breaker panel, I would tighten all the screws in the panel. I would tighten any connectors around it. I would put the cover on and line up all the screws the right way. We put all the screws back in the covers back in the day. You see, something changed when we went to flat rate. So now when we go to the new flat rate, it's different. We're changing back into a service mentality where we only want one thing, and that's for the customer to get exactly what they want. Now, the reason that we call it the new flat rate is because in searching for names for the whole idea, I realized that all my time as a service contractor, in 1996, when I bought my first flat rate program, every year when it came time to redo my pricing, I would always go to the backs of the magazines or go online and look for a new flat rate program to see if there was a better one than the one that I had. Everybody does that. So I knew if we kept flat rate in the name, then at least once a year, every contractor would find us online. And most all of our business, if it's not coming from referrals, it comes from people finding us online because they were looking for a flat rate program that would work better than the one they had. 
Flat rate's been around for over 20 years. Why are contractors still looking? Because the frustrations of number one, service technicians that don't want to sell, and number two, now the flat rate prices are too high at a time when the customer knows darn well prices are cheap. When you tell a customer that the capacitor is a single five microfarad capacitor, seven bucks at Supply House, and you tell them that it's going to be $135 to change it out, I know service techs that are like, hey, look, I can't charge them that much to do this part because I know it's $7. Even if you do have high overhead and all that stuff and the price is fair compared to what you're offering, in the service tech's mind, you're ripping a customer off because they know that it's $7 for the capacitor. That really takes a lot of that out of the equation because the one of the things I like to mention is the fact that with the new flat rate, you go through and replace all the spade connectors. You're able to go in and replace all of those wires that maybe are frayed or have a little bit of rub on them, but they're not completely messed up. But you just go through and you replace all that stuff under the new flat rate because you're not changing out just the capacitor. You're changing out everything around the capacitor also which is great. Well, interestingly enough, remember common sense, which allows the technician to replace any and all of that that needs to be replaced. But he actually doesn't have to replace anything that doesn't have to be. But it gives him the ability to use his eyes, use his tools, check every spade connector, check every wire nut, check every termination, and fix, repair, or replace the ones that need it so that when he's done, he can sign his name to that project. What would you say to a customer or even a technician who may bring up the objection that because there's not a part in the description, how would you handle a callback if it was a voltage absorption system and then the contactor went bad? The customer doesn't understand the difference between a contactor and a capacitor and the contactor went bad, say, six months later and they purchased, let's call it the Platinum Pro. How do you handle that? First of all, when people take your top options, it puts money into your pocket so that you can afford to take care of them. But in our drive to think of ourselves as professionals, which we are, we oftentimes don't give the customer credit. Think about this. I often say the answer to most questions is WWFD. What would Ford do? You go in and you get a starter put on your pickup truck and then it won't start. And so you bring it back a couple of weeks or a few months later and you think, oh, that starter must have went bad. And Ford looks at it and they say, oh my gosh, I'm sorry. It turns out that your battery happened to be six years old and your battery just went bad. The customer's like, oh, okay, I need a battery. Customers are not stupid. When they realize it's not the same thing, they don't expect you to warranty a part that was not covered. So that's the kind of objection or question we've always had. Remember when we went to flat rate? Mr. Customer, I've done a thorough diagnosis. I've checked through everything because I'm a professional. And here is the problem. It's this contactor right there. (laughs) What does the customer say? So that's $296. Boy, that's a lot of money. Okay. But if I replace that, you're telling me that's going to solve my problem. Absolutely. Yes, Mr. Customer. (laughs) Now, a month later when it quits, who's he blame? See? Technician. So now you go back and it's a capacitor. Now the technician has to be the bad guy because the customer, you said this would solve my problem. That whole he said, she said thing, that actually goes away with menu pricing. Sweet. So if they chose the Band-Aid option, would you charge them the second visit? I'm assuming that if they chose the Platinum option, you wouldn't charge them for the second visit. Here's what you don't understand. You've done this. I We've all done this, right? You go to Home Depot, you go someplace, your wife says, where are you going? Home Depot. What are you buying? Wrong stuff. (laughs) (laughs) How many times have you bought something and you should have bought a better one? I bought a $79 bench grinder. I regret it every time I use it. I've had it for years. I should just throw it away. I don't expect Home Depot to give me a new one. That's what I bought. You got to remember, I said, this is different. Here's old school thinking. The phone rings and the customer says, Hey, uh, Joe was out here a couple of months ago and he fixed our sink drain or he fixed our water heater or whatever it is. It's not working again. And we paid you $360 and you said that you take care. And so you say, oh, Mr. Customer, I'm so sorry. Tell you what, we'll try to get him right out there. Okay. We've all been through that, haven't we? Because now from the beginning, from the very first phone call, we're the bad guy. Now, believe it or not, flat rate pricing does that. It sets you up to be the bad guy because you have to convince them that it was worth it when they bought it. 
Now, here's the opposite. You go in there, Mr. Customer. I'm a little concerned. I found a fault in the temperature control system on your water heater, but don't worry, I've got some options. Point is, they take an option, and maybe it's got a 90-day warranty or one-year warranty, whatever it is. Let's say they take the bottom option, cheapest option. So then three weeks later, the phone rings. This is a different system. This is how the call goes. Hey, say Joe was out here a few weeks ago to fix our water. We don't blame him. It's not his fault. But he was here and we just took a cheap repair. We should have taken a better repair. So number one, they apologize. Number two, they say, don't blame your service tech. Now, here's number three. When he gets time, could you have him come back by here? Number three, they ask you to come at your convenience. And then number four, and when he's here, we probably just need to take a better option. They want to spend more money with you and let you do it right. You found that that's pretty consistent. That's the response that you've gotten. We are starting our seventh year with this. It's being used 30,000 times a week. We've got clients in all 50 states. I'm telling you, that's the way it's been since day one, period. Pretty much everything that we do that we talked about in the class and everything was all residential. Do you do any commercial work with the new flat rate program or is that something where it may be beneficial to stay on time and material? It's a whole new philosophy in your company. It will begin to it will affect everything that you do. It'll affect every process in your company. Most commercial work, if we're talking about service and repair, it's the same kind of work similar to in a house. Just maybe it might be a higher cost, might take more time. Like, for example, HVAC is easy to use an example. The package unit on top of the Sears store is the same residential style parts. Even a 12-ton unit is often two 6-ton units. A 10-ton is two 5-tons. You can easily use this system for all of that. When you get into heavy industrial chillers and things like that, then that's a whole different ballgame. But the more you use this in residential, you will start to use it in commercial. If you do commercial work, you will start to use it in refrigeration. It will begin to affect everything that you do. If people want to get in touch with you, what's the best way for them to reach out to you or to anybody at the new flat rate? We're very easy to find online. If you search for flat rate, you'll find us. If you search for menu pricing, you'll find us. But the new flat rate, they can email us, of course, at info at the new flat rate dot com. They can email me at rodney at menupricing.com. We'd be glad to go deeper and give them more information on any of this. And of course, they can call our office at 706-226-2055. But you know, we're just here to help. We're just thrilled that our average client sees an additional two to $5,000 every week in additional profit for every truck on the road. We all knew we were leaving all that money on the table. We all knew that. Well, the new flat rate picks up the lost opportunity. And that's what it does. I have a few questions left. This is more of the mastery round. These are going to be off the wall questions, but they're going to make you think. Just answer them as fast as you can. What did your childhood smell like? Chlorine and trees, because I was either at the swimming pool or in the woods. Awesome. That sounds a lot like my childhood. And what do you do in your free time whenever you're not wrapped up with the new flat rate? I ride four-wheelers, ATVs, uh, Polaris, Honda, Can-Am, almost every day of my life. Our family hobby is water skiing, all of my kids' wakeboard, including myself and my wife. So you're just pretty much an outdoors kind of guy. See, I have nine kids, and so we knew early on that we needed family sports that everybody could do together. So that's what we do. Awesome. You have a book out. What's the name of that book? is the cry of my life, which is, why won't they pay me what I'm worth? I love that title. That wasn't part of the Master Round questions. I just thought about it. So you're passed away. You're gone. What do you want people to think about? How do you want to be known when you're gone? Remember, the cry of my life was, why won't they pay me what I'm worth? Uh, Skilled technician, I had like 12 or 13 unrestricted contractors licenses, yet people still didn't want to pay me what my profession is worth. Our whole industry struggles because of that. The most exciting thing for me, what thrills my heart every day is that we're putting heavy, heavy profit, putting money, putting cash into businesses that formerly struggled. And I mean changing them, changing business owners' lives and building legacies that go three generations deep. 
So that's how you want to be remembered? That's right. Right now we're at, best I can guess, and pretty soon we'll have the analytics. Best I can guess right now, we are approaching $1 billion of gross profit that's been added to our clients' bottom lines. Right now it's over a quarter of a billion dollars a year in new money. And our industry has been struggling for years for money. So the new flat rate infuses more money every day in profit into contractors' lives than anything that has ever happened in the industry, period. That's a very proud feat that you have there. You've done good in the industry. Well, I appreciate you taking the time out and explaining a little bit about the new flat rate program and software. We could literally be here for two days and not have it all ironed out and explained. Early on, we saw the need for high quality staff and everybody that works here, including my kids. I don't try to put skills and talent into them. I try to pull it out. Okay. And it's amazing what's inside of people when they have a reason to express it. What book would you recommend other than your own for somebody to listen to as a business owner? A Jay Abraham's How to Get Everything You Want Out of Everything You've Got and Anything by Dan Kennedy. Dan Kennedy has a book that everybody should read with a highlighter and a pen. And it's called No BS, Ruthless Business Management. Well, thank you for spending time with us. We'll definitely speak again. All right, great. You have a great day, Terrence.